<clears throat> Some things never change, do they? More's the pity. The case you are about to see is fictional. The procedure, however, is legally accurate. The characters are played by actors, but the jury is selected from members of the general public. Mr. Justice Mowbray presides in the case of the Queen against Ryan, in which Dorothy Ryan has pleaded not guilty to causing grievous bodily harm to Hilary Charlotte Henshaw. Uh, you are Hilary Charlotte Henshaw and you live at flat 2 Telford Heights, Fulchester? Yes. And you are employed by Fulchester Council as a social worker in their social services department. I am, yes. Uh, my Lord, with your permission, I'd like to establish some of the background before coming to the alleged assault itself, to put it in some kind of context for the jury. As you wish, Mr. Wolfe, she's your witness. Uh, Miss Henshaw and her colleagues have compiled a detailed case history on the accused, my Lord, exhibit number three. I hope Lord. it's all relevant, Mr. Wolfe. Seems somewhat daunting, to say the least. Yes, well, I'm sure its relevancy uh, will become apparent as we go on, my Lord. Miss Henshaw, what is your relationship with the defendant? She's one of my clients, one of my cases at work. And what exactly was the defendant's problem, Miss Henshaw? Why did she need the services of your department? Well, she had difficulties at home connected with her children. What, financial difficulties? Well, not entirely. I mean, she has four young children and no husband, so inevitably part of her problem is financial. But it's more her overall attitude towards the children that we were concerned about. Did she neglect them? Well, she was just generally unable to cope with them, with the responsibility of them. Mr. Hendra, could you expand on that for us, just a little? Uh, unable to cope in what way? Well, neglect isn't only a failure to provide adequate food and clothing, is it? It's, it's also a failure to provide something just as fundamental, like a secure and stable home background, a, a framework of discipline for children to respond to. It, I don't necessarily mean that Dorothy doesn't care about her children. I happen to think she does, in her own way. It's... It, it's just that she can't seem to demonstrate it in any kind of practical sense. For example? Well, she regularly used to leave them alone at night when she went out. And she was also in the habit of bringing different men home with her. When uh, we tried to talk to her about it, explain the effect that kind of behaviour can have on children, she just said she'd ask them if she could go out and they'd said yes. <laughs> the same with men. She said she'd brought them back so that the children could approve them. You see, this is a recurring pattern in her behaviour, to put the responsibility for her, her actions on the children rather than accept it herself. How old are they, uh, these children? A girl of 14, my lord, two boys of nine and seven, and a girl of five. And the husband, what happened to him? Well, he and Mrs Ryan were divorced when the eldest child was three years old. Uh, who is the father of the youngest three? Well, they have different fathers, my lord, different men that Mrs Ryan became involved with after the collapse of her marriage. Yes, I see, thank you. All right, Mr Wolfe. Ah, thank you, my lord. Um, presumably, as her social worker, you were concerned about the situation, Miss Henshaw, about this apparent irresponsibility she was displaying? Mm, very, but primarily for the children. I mean, on a simply practical level, one had to ensure that they weren't at risk, that she didn't carry on leaving them unattended. Of course, I tried talking to her about it, but she just didn't want to listen. So, what did you decide to do? Well, by last June, things had deteriorated so much that I consulted my team leader and we decided we should put a place of safety order on the two youngest children. Yes, in other words, uh, you placed them into care. Yeah, but it was as much to shake Dorothy up as anything, to make her see the possible consequences unless she adopted a more responsible attitude. Mm. For how long did they remain in care? Uh, 28 days. It's the maximum allowed under that order. And had the defendant adopted a more responsible attitude in the meantime? Yes, for a time, it really seemed she had. We really felt we'd conquered the problem. But then by autumn, it had all started up again. Not only she started leaving the children, she had also started living with a friend. A man? Yeah. She just packed all the children up and moved them in with him. And you weren't happy about this arrangement? <laughs> Hardly. He lived in two rooms above the laundrette in the high street. And the children had to sleep in armchairs in the living room and share a lavatory with the customers downstairs. So, uh, what did you do about it? Well, I advised Dorothy she should go back to her own flat. Yes, and what was her reaction to this uh, advice? Well, she said she'd think about it. So the following night, on my way home from work, I called in to find out her decision. And the children were alone once more. Apparently, she and the friend had gone off to the pub for the evening. When you made this discovery that the defendant had once again left her children unattended, uh, what steps did you make? Well, I contacted my team leader and we decided to put a place of safety order on all of them. Yes, on all? Four children? Yeah. But you did subsequently 
returned them to the defendant some 28 days later, did you not? Well, we did the youngest three, yes. Well, by then she'd gone back to her own flat and promised to cooperate, so we thought we'd give her another chance. I mean, and nobody actually wants to split a family up, not unless they have to, unless there's no other way. Yes, but I understand that the defendant is on record as saying that you have, in fact, split up her family, Miss Henshaw, in that you did not return the eldest child with the others. Well, Marilyn's a special case. We, we felt she'd benefit from spending more time in a more stable home environment with the foster parents. It was the defendant informed about this decision? Definitely. Anyway, it wasn't my decision. Uh, uh, Miss Hendrell, could you explain, for our benefit, the difference between a temporary place of safety order and the institution of more permanent care proceedings? Well, a place of safety order doesn't have to be ratified at a former magistrate's hearing. It simply needs his or her signature. It's strictly a short-term emergency measure, if you like, meaning we can take a child into care for anything up to 28 days. Anything longer than that falls under Section 1 of the 1969 Children and Young Persons Act and has to be approved by two magistrates in a formal hearing. Uh, oh, that's very succinct. Thank you. All right, Mr. Wolfe. Uh, no, no. Um, now, at this official hearing concerning the future of Marilyn Ryan, what decision did the magistrates uh, make? Well, that she should remain in care, go to the foster parents who'd found for her. And did the defendant attend this hearing? No, we expected her to, but she didn't show up. So, when did she actually learn of the magistrate's decision? Well, I telephoned her the next day. She was very upset. She came right straight round to the office and started screaming and yelling at me, saying I'd engineered the whole thing, that, that I'd always wanted to wreck her family and now I'd got what I wanted. She even said I deliberately stopped her from knowing about the hearing. And she said, if she ever got me into a dark alley, she'd do exactly to my pretty little face as I'd done to her family. Smash it to pieces. She actually used those words? Exactly those words. I mean, I've seen her in a temper before, but never anything like that. It's not something you forget. When was the next time you saw her? The following night. I'd been working late at the office, and I went down to the car park to pick up my car. And she was there, waiting for me. Yes, go on. Well, I went to put something into the boot and she suddenly came out behind me. Did she say anything? She said, ah, there you are, I've been waiting for you. And then she lunged at me. Lunged? Uh, in what way? Well, she grabbed me and we struggled. And the next thing I remember is I, I was lying by the side of the car, covered in blood. Dorothy had disappeared, so I dragged myself inside and tried to find someone to take me to the hospital. Uh, a copy of the medical report on Miss Henshaw, uh, my lord, exhibit number two. My learned friend agrees to this report, my lord. Yes, that is so, uh, my lord. Would you tell the court what injuries you sustain, Miss Henshaw? Um, a gashed forehead. I'd have seven stitches in it and a cracked collarbone. I couldn't work for a month. Thank you. How old are you, Miss Central? Twenty-four. How long have you been a social worker? Nearly two years. Nearly two years? You know, that puts me in mind of when one asks a young child their age, they invariably reply, nearly ten or nearly eleven, in the hope of appearing older and more elevated than they actually are. Uh, my lord, he asked her a question and she answered it. Uh, yes, Mr Hurst, perhaps you could confine your observations, lucid though they are, to your closing speech. As your lordship pleases. Now, Miss Henshaw, in these nearly two years of experience. How many other place of safety orders have you instituted, apart from those concerning the Ryan children? None. Oh, why is that? Well, it hasn't proved necessary. Yes, and who decides if it is necessary? The magistrate who signs the order, the social worker, and any other relevant agencies. Agencies. I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with your textbook jargon, Miss Henshaw. What exactly are agencies in this particular context? Psychiatrists, education officers, the NSPCC. Yes, and presumably the recommendations of the relevant social worker carries a lot of weight in these cases. Well, they're closest to the facts, aren't Which they? Which you felt quite confident in assessing. Well, I should think when children are left for long, unattended periods, the facts speak for themselves. Yes, have the children ever come to any harm during these long, unattended periods? Not physically. But you felt some emotional damage might have been perpetrated. It's inevitable. Yes, but emotional damage is very difficult to assess, Miss Henshaw. I mean, we're all emotionally damaged to some extent, are we not? Is that supposed to be a question or what? Yes, let's move on, shall we, to these evening excursions the defendant apparently took when she allegedly left her, daughter, her children alone. Where'd she go, do you know? To the local pub, I believe. Uh, correct. For what purpose? <laughs> what do people normally do in pubs? To have a drink and enjoy yourself, I imagine. Incorrect. 
She actually went down there, Miss Henshaw, because she was paid to go down there for the simple reason that she worked there. Well, that's the first I've heard of it. Yes, well, I understand she didn't tell you because at the time she was on Social Security and, uh, and she thought you, you might report her. Uh, Mr Hurst, I hope your client is aware of the possible consequences of such an admission. Yes, yes, she is, my lord, but she's also very anxious to prove that she went out at night through necessity rather than choice because she couldn't adequately feed and clothe her children on what the state gave her. And yet you, Miss Henshaw, maintain that she went out because of her irresponsible attitude towards her children, that in fact her difficulties were emotional and not financial. Now, I put it to you that in fact the reverse was the case. And if you'd been a little less eager to interpret her difficulties as emotional and seen them for what they were, straightforward shortage of cash, might you not have been able to offer some practical solution instead of simply taking her children away from her? Now, Miss Henshaw, you said earlier, I don't necessarily mean that Dorothy doesn't care about her children. I happen to think she does. I also said in her own way. Yes, well, let's try and define what that way was, shall we? I mean, were the children, for example, given inadequate food? Did they, uh, oh, what's the expression, fail to thrive? No. No. And is there a history of the defendant ever being violent towards them, aggressive, anything like that? No. No. And was the school attendance officer ever required to take proceedings against the defendant? No. No. Miss Henshaw, when Mark and Susan, the two youngest, were placed in temporary care last June, isn't it a fact that the defendant went to visit them every day, every day for those 28 days without fail? I believe so. And yet you still maintain she has an irresponsible attitude towards them and only cares for them in her own way. Yes, well, with respect, you don't know all the facts. Oh, I'm only going on the case histories compiled by you and your colleagues, Miss Henshaw. Well, then, if you've read them, you'll see that since her husband left her, Dorothy has lived in no less than seven different squats and flats. Because practically every time she meets a new man, she insists on moving her entire family in with yes, him. Yes, well, arguably, that's better than simply abandoning them. She was endeavouring to keep the family together. But at what cost? What kind of emotional effect do you think these continuous upheavals have on young children? I understood your qualifications were in social work, Miss Henshaw, not psychiatry. Perhaps we could move on. Now, the magistrate's hearing, the one concerning whether or not Marilyn should go to foster parents. Now, you say the defendant was informed about this both by you, your team leader, and also by a letter from the principal court officer. Yes. Yes, well, the defendant will maintain that you did not, in fact, inform her, Miss Henshaw. That the first she knew about it was when you, when you telephoned her with the magistrate's decision the day after the hearing. Well, that simply is not true, because we told her about it in great detail. Yes, well, doesn't it seem odd to you that in spite of all these alleged attempts to, to tell her about it, she in fact failed to appear? No, because Dorothy's behaviour is very often yes, unpredictable. Yes, but didn't her absence disturb you? Well, of course. She has the full right of appeal against that decision, and since she wasn't there when it was made, her chances are extremely good. The magistrates at the time made that quite clear. Well, did you tell her that the day you telephoned her, the day she came round? See you. She didn't give me the chance. Oh, so the moment she made these threats about what she'd do to your pretty little face and so on, she did not in fact know that she had the right of appeal, that in fact the magistrate's decision could be reversed. I suppose not. You suppose not. Now, Miss Henshaw, these care orders, these place of safety orders you took out on the children, what, what right of redress does the, does the parent have? They don't. Oh? Well, they're simply there to do what they say, to allow us to take a child to a place of safety. It's only for 28 days. 28 days is nearly a month, Miss Henshaw. It's a long time to a child. It's a long time to separate a mother from her children. However, when the youngest children were returned, Marilyn remained in care under Section 1 of the 1969 Children and Young Persons Act. And at the magistrate's hearing, it was decided that this should, in effect, be more or less permanent. Well, it was to be reassessed at regular intervals. How do you think the defendant felt? I mean, she'd already had all four of her children taken away from her with no say in the matter, and then suddenly to discover that, 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 that her eldest daughter was not, in fact, going to be returned. Yes, well, as I've already told you, she was very upset yes, about Yes, she was it. upset, yes, exactly. And she made a threat which she had no intention of carrying out. Except that she did carry it out, didn't she? Yes, well, that's your interpretation, Miss Henshaw, because I further put it to you that by the following day, the defendant had changed her attitude. Because by then, she had received not only your letter, but the letter from the clerk of the court, informing her that she had the right of appeal. So she came to you that night in the car park to ask you to beg you, 
if necessary, to help her get Marilyn back. Marilyn wasn't even mentioned. She just lunged yes, at oh, me. Oh, you thought she lunged Look, she grabbed me. Yes, she grabbed me the by the weather arms. Like? What was the weather like that night, Miss Henshaw? <laughs> it was cold. Yes, it was, in fact, two degrees below freezing, so it wasn't just cold, it was icy. So? So, when the defendant made this grab for you, she was, in fact, slipping on the icy tarmac. She grabbed onto you for support, and when you fell, hurting your head on the rear bumper of your car, she, she panicked and she ran away. Well, it's possible that's how it could have happened, is it not? Look, I've told you the way it yes, happened. No, no, with respect, you've told us your impression of the way it happened. You are Nigel Patrick Egan, and you live at 98, the Crescent Fulchester. That's correct. And you are a team leader in the Fulchester Social Services Department. Yes. And it is your job to supervise the basic grade social workers uh, operating under you. That's right. And is it customary for a social worker with uh, nearly two years of experience to be handling a case as complex as the defendant seems to be? Well, not unusual at all. And two years' experience is actually a lot in our profession. You could have a hundred cases through your hands in that time, or even more. So you'd consider such a social worker to be quite competent to discharge his or her duties? Definitely. Now, let us move on to the care proceedings in the case of the defendant's eldest child, Marilyn Ryan. You initiated these proceedings, did you not? Together with Miss Henshaw, yes. Can you tell us why? Well, it's not easy to summarise. No single case ever is. But Marilyn Ryan is an extremely intelligent child, a brilliant child, in fact. The educational psychologists at her school rate her IQ as high as 150. This inevitably placed her at a disadvantage at home. In what way? Well, coming from the background she does, it uh, set her apart. Made her into an oddity, a, a misfit, if you like. As a result, she overcompensated in an attempt to become more acceptable. She began to ape her mother, staying out at night and so on. Except in doing that, she ceased to be acceptable at school, the one place where previously she had excelled. She began to fall behind with her studies, fail her exams. As a result, she became confused about what role she should play, what path she should follow. The natural consequence of this confusion was an acute sense of frustration, which on occasions could make her violent. Oh, uh, to whom? Uh, to her brothers and sister, my lord. Her mother placed a good deal of responsibility for them on her shoulders and, consciously or not, she resented it. Her way of striking back was to strike at the source of the irritation, that is to say, at the children themselves. And so you tried to alleviate the situation by placing Marilyn with foster parents? Yes, we felt she should be in a less fraught atmosphere until we could resolve things. Yes, so it wasn't your intention to permanently separate uh, Marilyn from her family? Oh, on the contrary. A compulsory care order does obviously suggest that, but it can be a positive rather than a negative step. It, uh, it allows a cooling off period, if you like, during which time those concerned can work together to eventually reunite the family. And was this explained to the defendant? Oh, in great detail. When the date of the magistrate's court hearing was set, we invited her into the office to uh, put her in the picture about her rights and so on. And did she seem to understand what was being said to her? She was very hostile, naturally, but in the end she seemed to grasp the situation. We told her to get a solicitor and how to get legal aid. And am I right in saying that your principal court officer also wrote to her covering more or less the same ground? Oh yes, that's routine in these cases. So in fact you did everything you could to inform her of her statutory rights under the relevant law? Most definitely. Mr Egan, you were present when the defendant visited Miss Henshaw in her office after learning of the magistrate's decision concerning Marilyn. Yes. Would you tell us what happened, please? Well, I was passing Hillary's, uh, Miss Henshaw's door when I heard shouting. I went in to find Dorothy leaning over the desk, yelling abuse at Miss Henshaw. I can't remember all of it now, but when I tried to intervene, she rounded on Miss Henshaw and said she'd like to get her in a dark alley and smash her face in. Well, those may not be her exact words, but that was the general gist. Did you take this threat seriously? <laughs> well, if you mean... Did I think she meant it? Yes, every word of it. Thank you, Mr. Egan. Mr. Egan, if Hillary, um, uh, Miss Henshaw, really was in the danger you apparently believed her to be, surely you wanted to do something to protect her? Well, there wasn't much I could do, was there? Yes, on the contrary, Mr. Egan, there were plenty of things you could have done. You could have alerted the police, for example, but you didn't, did you? 
because you knew it wasn't necessary. You knew these threats were idle ones made by an extremely upset woman who would later think better of it. Now, Mr. Regan, you say that one of the reasons you took Marilyn into care was because she was violent towards the other children. Yes. Yes, well, how did this violence manifest itself? What form did it take? She used to slap them, generally lash yes, out lash at out them. with her hand or with a weapon. With her hand. With her hand. And did they subsequently have to receive medical attention because of this? Uh, not as such, no. What does that mean? Well, the health visitor was very worried about uh, Susan, the youngest child. Apparently, she often had bruising about the head and legs, quite extensive bruising. Yes, what explanation was given for this bruising? Oh, that she'd fallen downstairs, tripped up, that sort of yes, thing. Yes, but surely most children suffer bruising. I mean, my own children are living testament to it. Yet no one's ever suggested that their injuries are anything other than accidental ones um, sustained during childhood pranks. I'm sure in their case there's no reason to suspect otherwise. Yes, that's all we're talking about, isn't it? Suspicions which may or may not be unfounded. I mean, squabbling between siblings, particularly when there's an age gap and one of them is particularly bright, is not uncommon, is it? Well, that is a matter of both opinion and degree. Yeah, exactly, Mr. Egan. And yet you thought your opinion was sufficient grounds for taking a young child away from her mother. Look, you must appreciate there are many factors involved in a case like this, many complexities. That was just one of them. Well, perhaps you'd like to give us some of the others, Mr. Egan. Marilyn Ryan was, is, a very disturbed girl. For one thing, her mother's various relationships with different men was beginning to seriously affect her own attitude towards sex. She openly admitted to having advanced sexual relationships. She was even proud of it. And at one time, she even talked about quitting school in order to live with some man she'd met through her mother. Yes, but isn't such behaviour fairly common amongst teenagers? I I'm not condoning it, but is it really so rare? She was just 13 years of age. 13? Well, quite apart from the moral and legal implications, she was also risking a very promising yes, academic no, future. You use the words moral implications. Do you feel it's part of your job to draw conclusions about what does or does not constitute a moral issue? It is part of my job to see that any child has the opportunity of knowing that there is a more acceptable alternative to their pattern of behaviour. Yes, but surely there are other ways than separating her from her family. I mean, sort of child guidance or, or, or therapy? No, she would still have been under the prevailing influence yes, of her mother. Yes, whose moral conduct you disapproved of? In that it jeopardises the future of one of her children, yes, but only in that context. Yes, but the other three children were jeopardised as well. I mean, why return three of them and hang on to Marilyn? I mean, where's the morality of that? Because they had not yet reached an age where their mother's behaviour could affect them in the same way. And when they do, what then? Will you put them with foster parents too? If it proves necessary. And yet you still maintain you are working to reunite this family. There's some discrepancy in your logic somewhere, Mr. Egan. What is logical, however, is that you took Marilyn away from her family in order to punish the defendant because you disapproved of her sex life. The case of the Queen against Dorothy Ryan will be resumed tomorrow in the Crown Court. The case you are about to see is fictional. The procedure, however, is legally accurate. The characters are played by actors, but the jury is selected from members of the general public. Dorothy Ryan is accused of causing grievous bodily harm to Hilary Henshaw, the social worker who was assigned to her family at the time when her children were taken into care. The three youngest children have since returned home, but the eldest child, Marilyn, is still with foster parents. We rejoin the case as Nigel Egan, Miss Henshaw's team leader, continues his evidence. Mr. Egan, isn't it somewhat unusual for a social worker or a team leader on their behalf to press charges against a client? 
Don't they usually regard such incidents as the alleged assault on Miss Henshaw as hazards of their profession, something they've just got to put up with? Well, as a rule... Yes, well, can you tell me why you've made an exception in this case? Because the situation with Dorothy can only deteriorate. After the magistrate's hearing, she made it abundantly clear that she would reject any further help we offered. What were we to do? Just leave her to her own devices to reel from one crisis to another until we were forced to take all her children away from her? In pressing this charge, we hope that she will be referred to a more disciplined framework of care, that she'll get probation and undergo psychiatric treatment, treatment which she has persistently refused over the years and which, in my opinion, she badly needs. This is one way of seeing she gets it. Let me get this quite clear, Mr. Regan. Are you telling this court that you've not only put the defendant through this trial, taken her children away from her, but all this trauma was for our own good? I repeat, she needs help, and this is a way of seeing she gets it. Mr. Egan, when the magistrates made their decision concerning Marilyn Ryan, there was a great deal of ballyhoo, wasn't there? Local publicity about the rights of social workers to split up families and so forth. Oh, just the usual banner headlines. The media have generally proved unsympathetic to us, mostly because they totally fail to understand the difficult and complex nature of our job. Yes, well, I put it to you. Your attempt to rectify this misnomer was by bringing charges against my client in the hope of using this trial as a public platform in order to sway sympathy uh, to, the, I, to the problems the of Lord, your profession. I, uh, just where are statements like this supposed to get us? Yes, I'm inclined to agree, Mr. Wolfe. I think it's time you pursued another line of questioning, Mr. Hurst. This seems to be accomplishing nothing. As you please. And I should just like to say that I refute that statement utterly. I'm here for one reason, and for one reason only, and that is to help Dorothy Ryan in the only way she's left open to me. And far from swaying public opinion in our favour, all this will undoubtedly have exactly the reverse effect. In the view of most members of society, social workers are not only incompetent, but do more harm than good. And I doubt that the doings of one courtroom will do much to change that view. Yes, well, if you finish, perhaps we could press on. Now. Mr Egan, the defendant is a product of care herself, is she not? in that she spent a great deal of her childhood in state residential institutions. Yes, she did. How did that come about? Oh, her, her father died when she was five years old, my lord, and her mother subsequently abandoned her. Now, we're talking of some 30-odd years ago, of course, but isn't it fair to say that in such places, every decision, both trivial and important, was made for the children? In short, they became institutionalized. Yes. Yes. And as a result, is it equally fair to say that such children often show, often show a marked inability to take decisions or display any kind of personal responsibility in later life? Well, that's an obvious byproduct of their environment, yes. In your view, does the defendant fall into that category? Up to a point. Yes, well, knowing that and presumably being sympathetic to it, I mean, wouldn't it have been possible to encourage her to undergo behavioural therapy rather than simply depriving her of her children? Well, theoretically, yes, but as I've already said, she persistently refused psychiatric help. Yes, but you did explain to her that if she agreed to it, you'd be more inclined to let her children remain with her. Of course. That was always a very strong lever in our argument. Yeah, did she seem to understand the argument? <laughs> in that she rejected it, yes. Well, if she really understood it, Mr Egan, I doubt if she'd have rejected it. I suggest that because of her background, she was so intimidated by anyone representing the state or authority that their very presence threw her into such confusion that she understood little or nothing of what was being said to her. I mean, that was, the, that was how she was in that meeting before, before the magistrate's hearing, wasn't it? I mean, she came out more confused than she went in. Well, with respect, that's rather a simplistic view of the facts. Yes, the truth often is simple, Mr Egan, for those who care to see it. One final question. Have you ever had occasion to call a defendant a born troublemaker? Remember you're on oath. Yes. Well, can you tell us why? It was she who informed the press about the magistrate's hearing concerning oh, Marilyn. I see. Amongst other things, she also told them that we had failed to inform her the hearing was even taking place. So that when a reporter phoned for my comment, I, well, I was caught rather off guard. I told him not to pay too much attention to what she said and that she, she was a born troublemaker. It was just one of those things one says in the heat of the moment. In the heat of the moment, yes. Rather like when my client made her threat to Miss Henshaw in the office that day. Wouldn't you say? You are John Leo Ryan and you live at 8 Keeble Road, Fulchester? Yeah. What is your profession, Mr Ryan? What job do you do? I'm a senior telephonist at the Fulchester Exchange. 
And uh, what is your relationship with the defendant? She's my ex-wife. And how long were you married? Five and a half years. We split up in 1967. How many children as a result of this marriage? One, a daughter, Marilyn. Mr. Ryan, I want you to tell us, as briefly as you can, the reasons why your marriage failed. Why you finally left your wife. Well, she you mean, what did I divorce her for? Adultery. And when did this start? Uh, at what stage in your marriage did uh, things deteriorate between you? It was about two years after Marilyn came along. I was driving then, mini cabin, evening work mostly. Dot took the going down the pub, dumping Marilyn with the neighbours and going out every night. I said if she wanted a drink, she could get some in and stay in and look after the baby. She just said it wasn't the drink she was after, but the company. Male company, did she mean? Yeah, well, I thought she meant her mates, you see, women friends. Then I heard all this talk about these fellas she'd been with. Not just one, different one every night of the week. Well, I tackled her about it and she said it was a load of lies, just malicious gossip. I believed her at first. I wanted to believe her, I suppose. And then one night I followed her in the cab. She didn't go down to Boozer at all. She went straight round this man's flat. Lying about outside for a while and then, uh, well, I crashed in on him and caught him at it. And uh, what did you do? Well, I went home and packed my bags and cleared out, wouldn't you? Weren't you concerned, Mr Ryan, about leaving your daughter with her, I mean, after such behaviour? Well, I didn't like it. Of course I didn't. But what could I do? I was working all hours that God sent. I was living in a hostel. I couldn't take her there, could I? What choice did I have? Subsequently to that, Mr Ryan, what contact have you had with your wife? You still live quite near to her, don't you? Well, yeah, I've seen her around in the shops, so usually with a different man. Yes, and is your impression that her behaviour has altered since the collapse of your marriage, uh, that she's changed at all? She's had three other kids since then, and she speaks for herself. Thank you, Mr Ryan. Mr Ryan, prior to this incident, when you followed your wife in your cab, how were things between you? All right. You're on good terms, were you? Well, we had the odd scrap, nothing serious. Yes, there were occasions, weren't there? Several occasions when the neighbours had to call the police in because of violent rows between you and the defendant. It was just people in the theory, wouldn't it? No, no, there were, there were two occasions, were there not, when your wife had to go to the hospital because of injuries sustained during these so-called scraps of yours. Well, I'm not saying the fault lay entirely with her. Of course I'm not, but you don't know her. I mean, some t sometimes it seems to be the only way to get through to her to make her see where her responsibilities lay. Yet you still maintain you are on good terms. As good as I ever were, yeah. Now, you say you went into this flat and caught them at it. By it you presumably mean sexual intercourse. Well, uh, working up to it, at any rate. Working up to it, Mr Ryan? Well, it's a long time ago. I can't remember all the details, yes, can I? Hardly a detail, surely. Well, they were sitting on the sofa with their arms round each other. Sitting on the sofa with their arms around each other. Mr Ryan, isn't it a fact that these frequent rows between you and the defendant were because of your irrational, uncontrollable jealousy? that you consistently accused her of having affairs with every man she happened to meet, happened to talk to? I was proved right. You I was proved right. right because your attitude drove her into it. Now, when you instituted divorce proceedings, Mr Ryan, you didn't pursue custody of Marilyn. Why was that? Well, I wasn't in a position to look after her, was Yes, I? now, you were given reasonable access, were you not, in that you were granted the right to visit your daughter more or less whenever you wanted to? Yeah. Have you ever, in fact, availed yourself of that right? Have you ever availed yourself of that right? Well, I thought it might make things difficult for her being caught between us, like. Anyway, I've remarried now, haven't I? If she wanted to, I would have, but she never did. Yes, we're talking about a child, Mr Ryan, your child, about whom you're apparently very concerned. Surely it was up to you to take the initiative as the father? Yeah, well, I thought it was better to leave things the way they were. Anyway, a kid's place is with its mother, isn't it? Especially a daughter. Exactly, Mr. Ryan. Thank you. Look on the right hand, read aloud the words on the card. I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. You are Dorothy Martha Ryan and you live at 12 Mansfield Road, Fulchester. Yeah. Mrs. Ryan. How would you describe your family, the relationship between you and your four children? Oh, very close. Very close. Now, we've heard that on occasion, Marilyn could be violent with her brothers and sister in the way of slapping them and so forth. 
Now, were you ever present when any of these alleged incidents took place? No, because it never did. She never laid a finger on them. Yes, now, you've heard that the social workers claimed she did, that, in fact, the uh, health visitor reported the fact to them. She never touched them. If she had, I'd have known about it, wouldn't I? Indeed. Now, we've also heard that your marriage ended in 1967. Can you tell us, please, how you supported your family since that time? By working. For working at what kind of job, Mrs Ryan? Whatever I could get. Um, cleaning mostly, factories and offices. Yes, how have you managed to do that with young children to look after? Well, when they were very young, babies, then uh, I'd have to go on Social Security. But uh, when they were old enough to leave, I'd put them with a minder, a baby minder, yes. so I could get back to work. Yes, a registered baby minder. This, oh, yeah. This the health yes. centre put me onto her. It was all official. So, for the greater part of these 12 years, you've managed single-handedly to support your family, with the exception of the few months recently when you've been unable to get a job. Yeah, that's right. Mm. Did you ever resent your children for that, for making your life so difficult, for the fact that you had to work so hard? Well, I, I wanted the best for them, so I worked hard to see they got it, like any parent. Quite. Now, Mrs Ryan, a lot of play has been made of the fact that you left your children unattended when you went down the pub, albeit to work. But now, they... can you explain this to us? They weren't unattended, that's just it. Do you mean you arranged babysitters for them, Mrs Ryan? Well, I arranged for the neighbours, you know, to pop in and look after him. Ah, but they were still alone in the house, weren't they? Well, it's not a house, it's a flat. I mean, all they had to do was walk out of their front door and into mine. And we all do it for each other. I mean, we all muck in for each other. Yes, so, so as far as you were concerned, they, they weren't, in fact, left unattended because you'd made arrangements to ensure that someone was looking after them. Oh, yeah. Yes, now, when Miss Henshaw expressed concern over this matter, uh, did you explain that to her? But she just get quoting the law at me, saying that they were underage and that they were on their own in the evenings. Well, I told her everyone in those flats does it, so, so how come it's only me she's pointing the finger yes, at? Yes, you felt you were being singled out, unfairly treated. Yeah, she could find fault with everything, that one. Everything. Yes, Mrs Ryan, how would you describe your relationship with Miss Henshaw? Did you get on with her? <coughs> Not so you'd notice. Why was that? Well, how would you like it? Someone was checking up on you. Asking questions, criticising, poking their nose in. What's she do about kids, anyway? She's hardly more than a kid herself, is she? Yes. Was it her youth you resented, or her as an individual, or social workers in general? Oh, no, the other one, Kevin, the one before her, we got along really well, you yeah. know, just fine. He made you feel good, like he really cared about you. She made you feel, oh, I don't know, useless. I used to just sit there. After she'd gone, just, just sit there. I couldn't even make the kids tea because she made me feel that whatever I did, I'd, I'd louse it up. Even that. Yes, now, as a result of this tension between you, did you stop cooperating with her? Ask to see another social worker? Well, I kept telling myself it was just her manner. I mean, they're supposed to be there to help you, aren't they? Social workers. Just thought she had a bloody funny way of showing it. Now, in June of last year, your two youngest children, Mark and Susan, were taken away from you and placed in care for 28 days. Now, did you at any time have any warning that this was going to happen? None. She just turned up with those other people and carted them off. Yes, well, after that, did she explain why she'd done it? Only that it was my fault, leaving them alone in the evenings. But if she told me, if she warned me, I'd, I'd have chucked the job in. But she never gave me the chance. Yes, now, think very carefully, Mrs Ryan. You're quite certain in none of your previous conversations with Miss Henshaw was it ever intimated what might happen if you continued to leave your children alone? Never! All she ever wanted to talk about was me. Not the kids. Just me, what, what I felt. How I was thinking. What did I think about my mum? Did I like myself? Stuff like that. Yes. Now, in November of last year, you took your children and you went to live with a Mr Alfred Potter in his flat in the High Street. Yeah. Uh, Mr Potter's ill at present, my lord, but we have a signed affidavit um, uh, supporting this evidence. My learned friend has no objection to be, being placed in evidence. Be Exhibit 6, my lord. Now, you're going to live with Mr Potter caused Miss Henshaw some concern, didn't it? Can you tell us how it came about? Well, it was only for two weeks, if that. He'd, he'd just come out of hospital. He's got cancer. Well, I said that I'd look after him, you know, till he got on his feet. Well, I couldn't leave the children, so I took them along with me. Was he your boyfriend? Well, he's a friend, if that's what you mean. I mean, he's hardly a boy. He's going to be 60 next birthday. 
Yes. Uh, yeah, did you... He's a mate, you know, yes. from, did from you... way back. Did you explain that to Miss Henshaw? Well, she wouldn't listen. She kept going on about the state of the lavatory and how was I going to get the kids to school. Well, I told her I'd take them on the bus, same as always. And if the loo bor bothered her that much, I'd, I'd clean it. Christ, I'm, I've cleaned enough in my time. Yes, One did, more wasn't going to work You did me. think over her suggestion that, that you move back to your own flat. Well, I knew then what she could do, didn't I? I mean, how she could take the kids away from me. Oh, sure, I agreed. If she'd asked me to stand on my head and whistle, God save the Queen, I'd have done it. Yes, Mrs Ryan, when Miss Henshaw later called round for your decision on that, uh, you were out and the children were once again left alone. Now, can you explain how that came about? Yeah, well, well, we'd been cooped up in that flat all day and Alf wanted some air. And I thought that Marilyn was going to be back, you know, from school to look after him. And she turned up first. Yes, and did you explain that to Miss Henshaw when, as a result of this, all four of your children were taken away from you? For all the good it did me. She said I was lying to, to her and to myself. Oh, she was always going on about things like that. Yes, now... When the care proceedings concerning Marilyn began, you were called in to see Miss Henshaw and Mr Egan, her team leader, weren't you? Can you tell us what took place at this meeting? Well, I don't know. It was, it was all so confused. I was confused. I, I don't mind admitting it. I mean, they'd give me back the other three children, but they kept Marilyn. It didn't make any sense. And all those telephones kept ringing, and, and people coming and, and going and, and him just sitting there tapping the desk and, and looking at his watch as, as if I was just a nuisance, a, a, a thorn yes. in his side. Mr Egan, this yeah. is. Yes. Now during all this, do you remember anything about a magistrate's hearing ever being mentioned and about your right to attend that hearing? They said a lot of things. I, co I couldn't take it all in. I kept asking them, can I have Marilyn back or not? And they said that it wasn't their decision to make. It wasn't up to them. Well, they were the ones who'd taken her away, weren't they? They could decide to bring her back. Yes, but they've also testified that you were also told about your rights in a letter uh, from their principal court officer. Yeah, well, I didn't open it. May I ask why not? It was in a brown envelope. I'm sorry, Mrs Ryan, I'm not sure in what way the colour of the envelope is relevant. Well, they're always bills, aren't they? I'm bills or bad news. Oh. Doesn't that make things a little inconvenient? Well, I'm not saying that I'll never open them. It's just that I'll, I'll put it off as long as I can. Oh, I see. Yes. All right, Mr Hurst. Thank you, my lord. Now, after this magistrate's hearing, uh, Mrs Ryan, when you learnt about the decision concerning Marilyn, what did you do? Well, she rang me. She said that it was all decided that Marilyn should go to these foster parents. Well, I was angry. She's, she's my child. Mine! Why should some stranger decide what, what's good for my child? And that's when I said what I said about what I'd do to her face. Did you mean it? Yeah. No. I, I don't know. All I knew was that I'd lost Marilyn, that they'd taken her away. I, I just wanted them to, to take notice of me for once. Just listen to me. Yes, Mrs Ryan, you subsequently received another letter, did you not, the next day? In fact, two of them. Firstly, from the clerk of the court, informing you of your right to appeal against the decision, and secondly, from Miss Henshaw saying more or less the same thing. Now, what did you do when you read these letters? Well, I went along to see Miss Henshaw. I wanted to talk to her away from the telephone and that office. So I, I waited for her in the car park, and when I went up to her, I must have slipped, and I grabbed onto her, and, and she fell, smashing her head against the car, against the bumper. Well, I crouched down beside her to, to see if she was all right, but she was just moaning, just, just lying there, moaning. And then I thought about what I'd said the day before and how it would look to everyone. So I ran away. In other words, you remembered your threat and you panicked. Yeah. And you did not go there with the express intention of hurting her? No, I went there because I wanted my daughter back and I wanted her to help me. Yes. Now, one final question, Mrs Ryan. Have you had any contact with Marilyn since she was placed in care and taken to foster parents? I can't visit her because they won't tell me where she is. But she writes to me every week. She wants to come home. 
Evelyn, she says in every one. In every last one. Mum, I want to come home. Please let me come home. Mum, I want to come home. Please let me come home. The case of the Queen against Dorothy Ryan will be concluded tomorrow when the jury reaches its verdict in the Crown Court. The case you're about to see is fictional. The procedure, however, is legally accurate. The characters are played by actors, but the jury, who today will reach their own unrehearsed verdict, is selected from members of the general public. Dorothy Ryan is accused of assaulting social worker Hilary Henshaw after her eldest child, Marilyn, was taken from her and placed with foster parents. <coughs> Mrs Ryan? You say Marilyn never touched the other children, never laid a finger on them. That's right. Young children are apt to play up, are they not? Did Marilyn never feel the need to physically admonish them in order to discipline them? Well, she, she never hit them, if that's what you mean. What, never? Never. Now, she must be made of uncommonly stern stuff, Mrs Ryan, or you've got remarkably well-behaved children. Now. When you used to go down to this pub, what time did you get back, uh, Mrs Ryan, as a rule? Uh, Midnight-ish. But you did, on occasion, stay out all night, did you not? Well, I was always back in time to get the kids off to school. Yes, but you did, on occasion, stay out all night. Mrs Ryan? Come along. Answer learned counsel's questions, Mrs Ryan. Well if I miss the last bus or things yes, like that. But the pub is only just around the corner, is it not, in the adjacent street? Isn't it a fact that you were out with a man, Mrs Ryan, and not always the same man? If you think you know the answer, why ask the question? Uh, because I want to provide you with the chance of disputing the answer should it prove inaccurate. Is it inaccurate? I could... I could count the times it happened on the fingers of one hand. So you do acknowledge it happened, and more than once. Now, just answer the question, Mrs Ryan, yes or no? Yes. Yes. You've also told the court they're supposed to help, aren't they, social workers? Uh, did you feel you needed help, then? They thought I did. Yes, but if you didn't, why agree to see them? Well, I didn't have any say in it, did I? Yes, but the social worker prior to Miss Henshaw did, in fact, help you, or so you implied. How exactly did that help manifest itself? Well, he used to talk to me and, and he knew how to listen. Yet you seem scornful because Miss Henshaw tried to do the self-same thing. Why? Uh, you didn't like her, did you? Which is why you persistently refused her offers of help and to heed her warnings about the possibility of your children being placed into temporary care. She never warned me about anything. She just went ahead and did it. Yes, but she did suggest that you see a psychiatrist, uh, Mrs Ryan, did she not, in order to sort out some of your problems? I should see a psychiatrist just because some kid says I should. Would you in my place? Well, if I thought it was in the best interest of my children. Uh, in, in the same context, Mrs Ryan, You've admitted you'd have done anything she asked, including stand on your head and whistle God Save the Queen. So why was the idea of seeing a psychiatrist so unpalatable? Because there's nothing wrong with me. Well, if that's the case, surely a psychiatrist would have helped you establish that fact. What had you to fear? Well, because just by agreeing to see one would have meant that I thought that there was something wrong with me. And there isn't. All that's wrong is those people meddling in my life. I mean, if they'd left me alone, none of this would have happened, would it? I'd still have Marilyn, we'd still be together, we'd still be a proper family. 
Mrs. Ryan, you've said you didn't open the letter from the principal court officer explaining your rights over Marilyn because it was in a brown envelope. Yeah, that's right. So what made the other two letters different? The ones you later received from Miss Henshaw and the clerk of the court telling you you could appeal against the magistrate's decision. They were also in brown envelopes, were they not? Well, I knew then that something was up, didn't I? I knew I had to open them. You seem to be remarkably discerning about your mail, Mrs Ryan, about what letters you do and don't open. I suggest these delaying tactics uh, you apparently have over brown envelopes are yet another example of your irresponsibility. Mrs. Ryan, and in fact, it extends to all three letters. You went to that car park with the deliberate and malicious intention of causing Miss Henshaw serious harm, didn't no. you? No. You went there to carry out your vindictive threat of the previous day because you didn't know that you could reverse the magistrate's decision. No, I went there because she said in her letter that she'd help me any way she could. Oh, now, come now, Mrs. Ryan, don't underestimate the intelligence of this jury. You read her letter after your attack on her, didn't no. you? No! And when you realised what you'd done, you changed your story accordingly. No. Isn't that really what happened? No, I didn't attack her. I fell. Yes, but you did leave her lying unconscious in that car park. Well, I panicked, didn't I? And I, and I ran because... Well, I knew that everyone would jump to the wrong conclusion. Tell me, did the idea of working in a pub appeal to you, Mrs. Ryan? Well, the money was good, if that's what you mean. Isn't it a fact that you took that job because you liked going down there, because of the male companionship it afforded you? Why well, shouldn't I do a job I like for once? You like your job, don't you? Yes, well, I don't have to leave my children for long periods of time in order to do it. Oh, well, that's lucky for you, isn't it? You've got a wife to look after them for you. Yes, well, it's not my domestic arrangements we're concerned with. Mrs. Ryan, would you say you got on well with members of the opposite sex? All right. You've had a number of men friends, haven't you, since your marriage ended, most of whom have been your lovers? Answer the question, Mrs. Ryan. A few. And as a result of three of these few, relationships, you became pregnant, did you not, with your three youngest children? So? Did the subject of marriage never come up with the prospective fathers? No, it didn't. Why? But Were they already married? It just didn't come up, that's all. It, it was my problem, not theirs. Yes, but surely they didn't abandon you when you became pregnant, all three of them? Well, they, they never knew about it. You mean because you didn't tell them? Yeah. Or you didn't know who the respective father was to tell him. Oh, my lord, really, the defendant has made no secret of the paternity of her children. And if my learned colleague would care to look at the birth certificates, he'll see that. Uh, yes, Mr. Wolfe. Oh, I'm simply trying to establish the moral climate in which these children have been brought up, my lord. Yes, That's all, all right. Very well, Mr. Wolfe. Yeah, my lord. Uh, Mrs. Ryan, you say you had to take this job at the pub in order to provide for your children, yet... When Miss Henshaw had the two youngest ones placed into care because you left them alone, you didn't tell her the reason you had to do it. Why? Well, I thought that she'd report me to the dull people. Yes, well, I suggest you didn't tell her because you knew she wouldn't believe you, and you're only raising it now in the hope that we're more gullible. Isn't that the real truth of the situation, Mrs Ryan, isn't it? I've always told the truth, and I've always taught my children to tell the truth. Indeed. You'd describe yourself as a good mother then, would you, in general? I, I do my best for my kids, if that's what you mean. I'm afraid that neither answers my question, nor is it in dispute, Mrs Ryan. What is in dispute, however, is whether your best has proved good enough. You all talk about best and good enough. Who's to say I love my kids any less than you do? Or you. Or her. Because I sometimes had to leave them. Have none of you ever had to shortchange your kids? Have you never made a mistake with them? Yeah. Because being a parent doesn't turn you into a saint, does it? You just have to do the best with what you've got. And I know the love that I've got for my kids. Because they're all I've got. All I've ever been allowed to have.
you are Kevin Michael Walker and you live at number three Cornwall Terrace, Fulchester. Right. And you were the social worker handling the defendant's case prior to Miss Henshaw. Yeah. Yes. Now, Mr. Walker, would you describe Mrs. Ryan's family as a close one? This was at the time you knew them. Mm, certainly. Yes. And would you describe Mrs. Ryan as a good mother? Why do you smile, Mr. Walker? Well, it's, it's one of those questions, isn't it? Well, I mean, there's, there's no archetypal definition of what does and doesn't constitute a good mother, is there? No ideal list of attributes you can look up in the local library. We all take it to mean different things, according to our own different standards. I mean, I happen to think Dorothy is a good mother, because she loves and cares about her kids very much. I mean, sure, she, she may be a bit chaotic in how she demonstrates that love, but it's never been in any real doubt. Well, not to me, at any rate. And certainly not as far as her kids are concerned which is the most important thing. Yes, they were quite secure in her feelings for them. Oh, no yes. question of it. Now, Mr. Walker, would you say the defendant was in need of psychiatric help uh, at the time that you knew her? No. And besides, she was so violently against the idea, it was academic if she did or didn't. Yes, did you suggest she see a psychiatrist? She came up once or twice. Yes, in, in what particular context? About her relationships with men. Why she felt she always had to have one around. Why she couldn't or or wouldn't say no to them. And as a result of these conversations, what conclusions did you draw? Now, one thing I discovered was that she didn't particularly enjoy sex for the sake of it. She wasn't promiscuous in any nympho sense. She just made the usual classic confusion between the sexual act and love. Because she'd been deprived of love as a child, she grabbed it where she could as an adult. She thought because a man wanted to go to bed with her, it automatically meant that he loved her, so... She always said yes to it. Did you inform Mrs. Ryan of this opinion? Yeah, she agreed with it. Well, I'm not saying she changed overnight. Her feelings of inadequacy were far too deep-rooted to that. But we, we were working towards that point pretty successfully, I thought. So you'd say her attitude towards you was uh, constructive, positive? Mm, very much so. The first thing you have to do with someone like Dorothy is to, is to make them feel that you like them, establish some kind of trust. Then you're away. Yes, it all comes down to tactful handling. In fact. Well, don't all relationships. Uh, yes, yes. One final question, Mr. Walker. In your view, based on your considerable knowledge of the defendant, is such an act of violence as the alleged assault on Miss Henshaw in any way in keeping with her character? Definitely not. Thank you, Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker, are you still a social worker? No, I'm, I'm working on a project with some friends. We're setting up a drugs rehabilitation centre. Was that your decision to cease being a social worker, or was the decision made for you? Well, let's, let's just say my superiors thought my approach too unorthodox. I thought theirs too reactionary, overcautious. I see. Now, you say you and the defendant discussed the matter of her seeing a psychiatrist, so presumably you must have entertained the idea of her seeing one. Well, it's an obvious avenue of help, isn't it? Yes, and when she refused, you decided to set yourself up as her analyst instead, even though you had no expertise or training in this field. I used to talk to her, not analyse her. Mr Walker, you've just given us a detailed account of what you believe is the root cause of her problems with men. Now, in order to track down that cause, you surely must have analysed the problem. I made a fair stab at it. A stab at it? You mean... you guessed? Based on my detailed knowledge of Dorothy and our conversations together, I made an informed opinion. I just want to make it plain to the jury that, once again, we are dealing with opinion rather than fact. Where did the children fit into all this, into all these psychotherapy sessions? They were a part of the overall picture. It's a very small part, apparently, in that you failed to take any steps to ensure their safety. They were perfectly safe. Perfectly safe, Mr Walker. Uh, during the time we're talking about, the year of 1977, you were working on another case, weren't you, in which you displayed similar reluctance about taking children into care, about taking out a place of safety order. I'm referring to the case of Mark Denham, who died as a result of injuries from his stepfather. That was an entirely different situation, entirely different. It was similar in that you made the same decision as you did in this case. Isn't it a fact, Mr. Walker, that you came into conflict with your superiors, not only because of your unorthodox attitude, but because you failed to take adequate measures to protect that child with tragic consequences? Oh, my Lord, that's a monstrous assertion. This witness isn't on trial here. 
Besides which, he was entirely cleared of blame at the official inquiry. Yes, Mr. Wolfe. I'm simply trying to illustrate that the highly individual approach of Mr. Walker has raised serious questions, my lord, which have a bearing on his attitude to this case. Well, let's stick to this case, Mr. Wolfe, and to the facts. And while we're on the subject of facts, let's just get one thing clear. All any social worker can do is to weigh them up as he sees them, which is exactly what I did. I didn't make a recommendation to take that child into care because, in my opinion, at that time it wasn't necessary. I mean, Christ. If I'd known there was that kind of violence in the family, I mean, don't you think I'd have done something? I mean, don't you think I... I wonder even now if, if maybe I didn't look hard enough. There was some question I didn't ask, something I didn't spot. Perhaps I was in the wrong and I'm to blame for his death. Who the hell knows? Because in the end, that's just a matter of opinion as well, isn't it? But you seem quite confident in your opinion that Mr. Egan and Miss Henshaw made a mistake in this case. How do you reconcile that? I'm not saying they made a mistake. But what are you saying, then? I'm saying precisely what you did before. And it's all a matter of individual opinion, and that's all it can ever be. Quite so. Mr. Walker. Now, Marilyn, I'm going to ask you some questions, and I want you to answer them as truthfully as you can. All right? Now, first of all, would you tell the court how old you are? Fourteen. Fourteen. Now, I want you to think back to last year, to when Miss Henshaw was visiting your mother. Now, were you ever present during any of these visits? Some of them. How did they seem to get on together? Well, Mum used to get into these states before she came. She always used to make us clear up the flat, you know, do the dishes, tidy up and things. Yes, now, did you get the impression that your mother liked Miss Henshaw, that she looked forward to her visits? No. That is... Yes? Go on, Marilyn. Well, it wasn't before that bothered her, it was after. She was always quiet after, do you know? Depressed, you mean? Yeah, and sometimes she'd cry. Yes, w why was that? Did, did she tell you? She once said she knew how it felt being on probation, always having somewhere to think the worst of you, waiting to catch you out. Yes, now I want to move on, Marilyn. Now, we've heard that your mother sometimes went out, leaving you alone in the flat when she went to work at the pub. That is right, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Now, who was supposed to keep an eye on you during this time? Do you remember? Mrs. Talbot next door, mainly. Yes, and how exactly was she supposed to do that? She had the baby thingy. Oh, what baby thingy? Uh, it's a baby alarm, my lord. Uh, exhibit 7, I think. Now, how exactly was this baby alarm operated, Marilyn? Well, the microphone bit, that bit, was in our hall. And the speaker part was in hers. We used to shove the call through her letterbox. So, in effect, she could monitor everything that went on in your flat by using this, uh, this microphone system? Yeah. Did you make that yourself? Was it homemade or something you bought in a shop? Or? Mum bought it second hand off someone. Yes. Now, how did you feel about your mother going out, Marilyn, uh, personally? Did it upset you, make you feel anxious? Why should it? How about your brothers and sister? D did you get on? Oh, got on all right. Yes, you see, I ask you this because we've heard that you sometimes used to hit them. Hit Susan, at least. Did you ever do that? No, I never. Marilyn, when you... When you were told you weren't going to return to your family after you'd been placed in care, what did you feel? They said I had to go to foster no, parents. No, 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 what did you feel personally? I mean, did you think you should, or, or, or do you think you should have been returned to your mother? My mother. Marilyn, were you ever told that your mother wanted you home with her by anyone, by, by Miss Henshaw, for example? Well, they said she couldn't cope with me. Oh, I see, and you believe them. You assume from this that your mother didn't want you back with her. But I thought it was what everyone wanted. I see. You were trying to please everyone, were you? Yeah. Thank you, Marilyn. Marilyn, just, Marilyn, just stay there, will you? Mr. Mr. Wolfe's going to ask you some questions now. Uh, Marilyn, you've told us how your mother got on with Miss Henshaw, but what about you? Did, uh, did you like her? I suppose so. So, uh, we can take it that uh, you didn't share your mother's view of her? Well, Mum just took against her. You know how people do. Yes, I see. Now, uh, you've told us that when your mother went out, Mrs Talbot from next door was left in charge of you using this uh, second-hand alarm system. How old is Mrs Talbot, would you say? Sixty. In fact, she's seventy-three. And uh, during the year we're talking about, 1977 to 78, she frequently had to go into hospital, didn't she? And eventually into a nursing home where she still is. 
Yeah. And your mother still went out quite often? Well, only on Fridays and Saturdays. Yes, well, they do tend to come round quite regularly, don't they? Have you had many boyfriends, Marilyn? A few. You had one boyfriend in particular, didn't you? Someone you met through your mother. How old is he? Can you remember? It's about 30-something. He's actually 42. <laughs> it's not what he told me. Uh, Mr. Wolfe, uh, what do you mean, someone you met through your mother? Uh, the defendant quite often held small parties, my lord, at which the witness was sometimes present. I see, thank you. Marilyn, didn't your mother object to you going out with someone much older than yourself? Uh, didn't she try and stop you? Yeah, at first. Marilyn, in this file about your family, there's a bit which says your mother had difficulty controlling you. Now, would, would you agree with that, that uh, you tended to go your own way, whether she liked it or not? Well, I didn't do anything she didn't. No, quite. I want to put something to you, Marilyn, and I want you to be entirely honest in your answer. Don't think about anyone else. Your mother, Miss Henshaw, your foster parents, anyone. Just think about yourself and what you feel. All right? Now, if you could choose, would you remain where you are or go back home to your mother? Just answer the best that you can, Marilyn. Go home. Are you asking us or telling us, Marilyn? You bitch! You lousy bitch! You said no one could make me go home if I didn't want to! You said you said they wouldn't make me! Members of the jury, the charge against the accused is causing grievous bodily harm with intent. That is the issue upon which you have to decide. The prosecution case is that the defendant was confused over her rights over her children, particularly her eldest child, Marilyn. She believed that Miss Henshaw had deliberately split up her family and that she'd never get Marilyn home again. As a consequence, she not only threatened Miss Henshaw, but carried out that threat in the car park. And so, the prosecution are suggesting, therefore, that the attack was deliberate, was maliciously premeditated, not only by the defendant's inability to face and understand the situation, but also by her personal dislike for Miss Henshaw. But the defence admit that the defendant did make a verbal threat to Miss Henshaw. But they claim that this was because she'd not been properly advised over her rights over her children. And as a result, she was justifiably angry and frustrated. They further claim that on the night of the incident, she'd received a letter explaining her rights and that she could, in fact, get her daughter back after all. So she went to ask Miss Henshaw to help her. And that she slipped over in the car park, accidentally pulling Miss Henshaw over. Now, there are no witnesses to this incident only to the threat. So it's for you to decide, members of the jury, if the two are connected or if the accused altered her attitude between these two events. Remember, it is for the prosecution to prove the charge, not for the defendant to prove her innocence. She doesn't have to prove anything. If you're in reasonable doubt, you must acquit. And I would you please retire, elect a foreman to speak for you and consider your verdict. Members of the jury, will you foreman please stand? Please answer this question, yes or no. Have you reached a verdict on which you're all agreed? Yes. Do you find the defendant, Dorothy Martha Ryan, guilty or not guilty of causing grievous bodily harm with intent? Not guilty. Mrs Ryan, you are free to leave this court. 